When you think of casino culture, one of the first places that comes to mind is Las Vegas, with its blinding lights and street performers along the Strip. Or, if you're into Old Vegas, the light-up canopy and rowdy parties along Fremont Street. Today's story takes place in a tiny casino town in Nevada that's not as well known, where a little girl met her tragic fate, overshadowed by not only the antics of her assailant, but by the bragging of a bystander who insisted upon not saving her life. This week's episode has been brought to you by June's Journey. June's Journey is a free hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story taking you back to the glamour of the 1920s with a diverse and intriguing cast of characters. Each new scene takes you further through a thrilling mystery that sets the main protagonist, June Parker, on a quest to solve the death of her sister and uncover her family's many secrets. She also has a knack for getting into tricky situations and solving her friend's problems in her own witty ways. When I have a spare moment, I've been playing June's Journey. It's relaxing after a stressful day, and I love the art. It reminds me of Downton Abbey. Want to play along with us? Download June's Journey for free by clicking the link below in the description. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Click the link in the description to download June's Journey today. Thanks and back to the episode. In the early morning of May 25th, 1997, 18-year-old Jeremy Strohmeyer, 17-year-old David Cash Jr., and Cash's father, David Sr., took a trip out to the Prima Donna Resort and Casino, now known simply as the Prim Valley Resort, for Memorial Day weekends. Located in the unincorporated community known as Prim, the Prim Valley Casino Resort is a group of three hotel casinos located along Interstate 15 at the California State Line and are a popular stop for folks traveling between Las Vegas and California. The first to be built was Whiskey Pete's, followed by the Prim Valley Resort, and then finally Buffalo Bill's. Also present at the resort was seven-year-old Sharice Iverson, whose father Leroy was spending the early morning drinking and gambling. Her father left Sharice in the care of her 14-year-old half-brother Harold in the casino's arcade. But like most 14-year-olds, Harold didn't really want to be bothered to watch his sister, which resulted in Sharice wandering about the casino floor unmonitored. Sharice had been returned to her father on two separate occasions by resort security, and it should be noted that our story takes place at around 3 o'clock in the morning. Sharice's mother Yolanda, a 28-year-old cafeteria worker, was back home in Los Angeles at this time. During one of the times that Sharice was left unattended and wandering about the casino floor, she caught the attention of Strohmeyer, who began making playful contact with her. Eventually, Strohmeyer followed Sharice into the women's restroom. While in the restroom, the two began crumpling up paper towels into wads, soaking them with water, and then throwing them at one another. During the lighthearted melee, Sharice eventually picked up a yellow plastic wet floor sign and tossed it at Strohmeyer. Strohmeyer's friend, David Cash Jr., entered the restroom and witnessed Strohmeyer forcibly taking Sharice into a large handicap accessible stall. Rather than intervening, Cash stepped into an adjacent stall and peeked up over the side. The teen witnessed Strohmeyer holding his left hand over Sharice's mouth to stifle her screams. And again, rather than intervening, Cash decided to leave the restroom. It was at this moment that Strohmeyer began to essay Sharice. 20 minutes later, Strohmeyer rejoined Cash on the casino floor and confessed to him the unthinkable that Sharice Iverson was dead. He then went on to explain that he strangled the young girl, but then he noticed that he hadn't quite killed her. So he decided to twist her head in an attempt to break her neck. After hearing a loud popping sound, he rested her body in a sitting position on the toilet with her feet in the bowl. By his own recollection, Cash Jr.'s only response was to ask Strohmeyer whether Sharice had become aroused. So you think with... David Cash knowing all of this information about what just happens, you'd think he'd go to some sort of security guard or call the police or something to turn his friend in, but you couldn't be more wrong about that. The two guys, for the rest of the night, hung out, had fun, and rode roller coasters. 
It was as if nothing happened between the two. And David Cash was able to be in the presence of Strohmeyer, not even bothered knowing that he had just killed Sharice. After the holiday weekend, the two returned to school in Long Beach, where they were star math students at Woodrow Wilson High School. But the two wouldn't remain free for very long. When police released the video surveillance tape showing Sharice running into a woman's restroom, chased by Strohmeyer at 3.47 a.m., along with other footage, the two were quickly identified by their classmates who saw the broadcast on television. Strohmeyer was arrested and Cash agreed to testify. However, Cash was never charged with a crime. In Nevada, as in many states, he did nothing illegal. According to Las Vegas Police Sergeant Kevin Manning, quote, there is no law requiring citizens to report a crime and no law requiring them to stop a crime. There is a moral obligation, but we don't arrest people on moral issues, end quote. Strohmeyer was charged with first-degree homicide, first-degree kidnapping, and essay of a minor. When questioned by police, Strohmeyer provided a full confession and outlined the details of Sharice's death. Displeased with cash, Woodrow Wilson High School expelled him and forbade him from attending graduation ceremonies. However, he showed up anyway, waving to television cameras from a white limousine and going to a friend's house to watch himself on the news. Then, as he was about to start a nuclear engineering course at Berkeley, David Cash began to talk on radio and television shows. Cash told the Los Angeles Times, quote, I'm not going to get upset over somebody else's life. I just worry about myself first, end quote. He then later told the CBS television show 60 Minutes, quote, I don't feel there is much I could have done differently. Furthermore, he said, I didn't want to be the one to turn him in. He's also my best friend, end quote, basically showing he had no remorse about not seeking help during Strohmeyer's attack. Backtracking to the grotesque comment Cash made to Strohmeyer at the casino regarding Sharice, he told a stunned Los Angeles Times reporter, that's just the way I think. Cash also told a radio call-in show that his notoriety was helping him to score with the ladies. He also said that he did not know Sharice Iverson, so he could only feel bad about his friend Jeremy in this situation. Students at Berkeley held protests demanding Cash's expulsion. Twice the student body has passed resolutions asking Cash to leave, but its president vetoed them, claiming that he did not believe that it's the organization's right to cast moral judgments without the benefits of due process. Similarly, the university chancellor agreed that the school has no grounds to expel Cash as he hasn't violated any school rules or broken any laws. Strohmeyer obtained the counsel of defense attorney Leslie Abramson, who had represented many high-profile clients, including the Menendez brothers. Strohmeyer claimed he was high on alcohol and drugs, including meth, at the time, and he did not remember committing the crime. It was even suggested that perhaps the witness, David Cash, had, in fact, been the one to kill Sharice, as Strohmeyer claimed to have no recollection of his actions and the witness was the one to actually tell him what he had seen him doing in the bathroom that night. Abramson also noted that Strohmeyer's biological father is in prison and his biological mother is in a mental hospital. Abramson also tried to have the confession that Strohmeyer provided to police suppressed because he was not given legal counsel. However, the police claimed that Strohmeyer waived his right to have an attorney present during questioning. Strohmeyer's trial was scheduled to begin in September of 1998. He was originally facing a possible death sentence for the homicide, but hours before his trial was to start, Abramson entered a plea bargain on his behalf. On September 8, 1998, Strohmeyer pled guilty on four charges, first-degree homicide, first-degree kidnapping, essay on a minor, and an additional charge to include bodily harm. On October 14, 1998, he was sentenced to four life terms, one for each crime he had pled guilty to, to be served consecutively without the possibility of parole. In a rambling diatribe in court, he blamed a variety of people for the crime his adoptive parents, the America Online Internet Service Provider that first allowed him to see adult materials, the Nevada Gaming Commission, which did little to patrol the casino, and finally, 
He blamed David Cash for failing to stop him. In October of 1999, Strohmeyer's parents, who had adopted him, filed a $1 million lawsuit against the Los Angeles County and its adoption workers. They claimed that social workers deliberately withheld crucial information that would have stopped them from adopting him as an infant. Specifically, they claimed they were never told that Strohmeyer's biological mother had severe mental problems, including that she suffered from schizophrenia and had been hospitalized more than 60 times prior to Strohmeyer's birth. Sharice Iverson's death led to the passage of the Nevada State Assembly Bill 267, which required citizens to report to authorities when they have reasonable suspicions that a minor was subjected to a crime like the one we've outlined regarding Sharice. This directly stemmed from Cash's inaction. The bill provides a fine and possible jail time for anyone who fails to report a crime of this nature. Strohmeyer was initially incarcerated at Eli State Prison, a maximum security prison where most prisoners in Nevada who are serving life without parole are imprisoned for at least an early portion of their sentences. Apparently, while he was at Eli State Prison, he was in protective custody the entire time so that the other inmates wouldn't attack him. Strohmeyer was reportedly transferred to the Lovelock Correctional Center in Lovelock, Nevada, where he is classified as medium custody. He has attempted to appeal his sentence on several occasions, all of which have thankfully failed. Sharice's father, Leroy, asked the Prim Valley Casino Resorts for $100, a room at the hotel, dinner for his 14-year-old, and Sharice's funeral expenses, as well as some beer. It is our understanding that he signed away his right to sue the casino in return for these things. Let us know down below in the comments if you think this is fair, if you personally would have accepted these things, or if you would have gone ahead with a lawsuit. Several sources have noted that the reason why this case gained national attention is not necessarily because of Sharice, but because Jeremy Strohmeyer coming from an affluent background and being popular as well as the head of his class. And finally, according to a post on Facebook from the page Past and Present Sankofa, Plains Exploration and Production Company, which is one of the largest oil companies in California, actually hired David Cash Jr. as one of their equipment operators. Cash was lucky to receive this high-paying job, all thanks to his nuclear engineering degree from the University of California in Berkeley. However, Cash was later doxxed and no longer works for the company and received threatening phone calls at his home due to outraged citizens. And as of 2022, his current whereabouts are unknown. We both wanted to say thank you to everyone that has donated to Prada's GoFundMe. So we wanted to make a couple slides here with the names of everyone who was so generous enough to donate to Prada's Care. Thank you all so very much for helping Prada out. It means the world to us. She is currently sleeping right now, so she didn't get to make an appearance today. But I assure you, she is very mouthy and very aggressive and headbutts us constantly. And if you'd like more consistent updates about what's going on with Prada's care, please check our GoFundMe below. We update that more frequently. We also have a very wonderful group of people supporting us on Patreon. I will put their names up right now. I want to say welcome to seven new patrons, Lettuce, Cynthia, Shane, Kathleen, Lee, Tiffany, and Cody. Special shout out to our Levi tier patrons, Levi, Holly, Chaka, Amelia, Laura, and Cody. There's their lovely pictures right now. Special shout out to our highest tier Patreon supporters, Kiki and Melissa. There's their lovely pictures right now. Thank you all for going that extra step to support us in the ways in which you have. There's Halls and Dolls, Holly's Mask Store. If you want access to the best quality masks we've ever worn, Holly's Etsy link is down below. One last thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, June's Journey. Click the link in the description below to download it today. But until next week, we love you. We love you. Bye. Bye.